Sup fam, welcome to the Reddit Show. I'm your host, JF Kevin. Today we have two great stories for you. The second one, if you're a musician, it'll teach you not to mess with your engineer. Our first story today was posted by Call Me Swellington. I was fired for inadvertently stumbling on my boss's malfeasance. I used his obsession with golf and watches to get him fired. This was in the last throes of the analog mid-90s. Fax machines, FedEx, dial-up, computing, and voicemails were the most common business tools. I was a young regional sales manager of a major branded consumer product. I covered the grocery class of trade in 11 western states. My division worked out of Chicago and I had a home office in the west coast. I had made my reputation by typically making my quota and keeping costs within budget. I would get reassigned to struggling markets and more often than not, I would usually make my sales number. Nothing too fancy, I just figured where the best opportunities were and concentrated on them. In those days we had something called Market Development Funds, MDF, or as we call it, Making Days Fun, in the time before such things were deemed illegal. It was money we could literally use for almost anything you could imagine. Whining and dining, sending buyers to the Super Bowl, taking them on market research trips. I once took six honchos for a weekend of fishing in Mexico. As long as you had the receipts and your boss knew, except in cases where they specifically asked not to know, we were free to spend money as we saw fit. This was old school Mad Men style slush funds, all tax deductible. Typically the MDF money was 2% of your total annual gross sales and was use it or lose it, meaning it had to be spent because it wouldn't roll over. I had always had some left over. As a team player, I would let my boss Sasquatch know so he could use it, no big deal. Towards the end of the year, my weekly FedEx pack from the company started including sign-offs for payments to a supplier I had never heard of before. What was weird is they were for a demo company that wasn't one of my regional suppliers. If you've ever been offered a sample or a coupon in a grocery store, that's what a demo company was. I called the broker slash agent in that market and learned that they had never used the company or even heard of them. I finally figured out that they were from Sasquatch and that he had thrown them in with my other sign-offs. I called him and asked if he knew what they were. He said that they should be assigned to my MDF and not to worry about them. This was a little unusual because demos would normally be taken out of our monies or come down from marketing. Eh, whatever, I signed off on them. About three months later I was called into HQ for a meeting where I was told I was being transferred to a market that I had never worked before and would be required to relocate. At the time, my wife was pregnant and we had just started an extensive remodel on our newly purchased house. The company had some relocation benefits, but it was just too hectic to pull up roots and move to the southeast. I declined the offer and was told that I could look for another job within the company or receive a severance package. I wound up taking the severance. Several months later, one of my ex-coworkers told me that my region had been taken over by one of Sasquatch's past work associates who he managed to get hired in my spot and that the region was tanking. Badly. Nothing made sense. Why was I terminated and then replaced by someone who lived in another city who couldn't do the job? I started to think in my naivety that I may have put a target on my back. After some research and digging, which was much harder before the internet, I learned that the demo company billing the MDF was based in my ex-boss's previous city and was just a PO box, a telephone, and a DBA registered by the new person in my job. I later found out it was his girlfriend slash mistress. I was livid. Like most people, I tend to plan revenge in my head but never really go through with it. Most of the time, it's a coping mechanism and not very useful in moving on past being wronged. But this was so egregious, so uncalled for, and so disruptive to my life that I had to get even. My plan evolved to take this guy down. Whatever the time it took, whatever the costs in lives or money, I was gonna get this mofo. I may have been able to rat him out to the company, but they might have dismissed my complaints as coming from a disgruntled ex-employee with an ax to grind. I decided I was going to approach the guy as a phony recruiter, not just a guy collecting resumes, but as a retained corporate headhunter, someone paid to onboard people for big jobs. I had spent a year early in my career working for a super exclusive headhunting firm and knew exactly what transpired in the process. My subterfuge required international taxes, phony letterheads, faked English accents, and overseas friends to do my bidding. Sasquatch was obsessed with expensive watches and golf. He played regularly and watched pro golf both on TV and live. He would incessantly chatter on about both subjects. To bait him, I arranged for him to be approached for an executive position with a major Swiss watch company for a position tied to pro golf and other swanky sports sponsorships and included a shopping list of benefits and prerequisites. 
The job would require hobnobbing with major sports organizers, flying around the world in first class, and basically spending money. It was a job he could only dream of. In the slow and methodical long con, I strung him out until the time was right to close with an offer. The only catch was that he had to report to Switzerland for a final offer and onboarding. I deliberately scheduled it for the week of our old jobs, division meetings, and reporting. See, they were mandatory and impossible to miss without raising red flags. Sasquatch was worried that his absence would be impossible to cover, especially if he was out of the country. So the headhunting firm said that they could move the appointment up a few days so that he would be able to attend his meeting, but that he would need to purchase an unrestricted business class seat and make his own hotel reservations. Save your receipts and the watch company will reimburse you, he was told. Sasquatch showed up to a swanky hotel suite using his own credit card for the very expensive room and promptly received a note from the watch company that his appointment had to be rescheduled for the following Monday because of a major corporate crisis. Sasquatch called the phony recruiter in a panic about missing the corporate meetings back in the States. It was agreed that he would call in sick and that whatever happened with the old job, he was heading to much greener fairways. <laughs> Oh, enjoy your weekend in Europe. By Monday, you'll be in your dream job. While Sasquatch was cooling his jets in Europe, I nonchalantly called his boss, the president of the division, and casually asked for a reference on Sasquatch's work ethic and dates of employment. You'd be surprised how often this mistake happens. The president, to his credit, didn't tip his hand or act very surprised by the call. But like a good corporate wonk, he referred me to human resources. I let it slip that he was in Europe finalizing his new job and that he'd already given the company notice. Oops, my bad. Eventually, I was able to put together the aftermath from old co-workers and other people in the trade who didn't know I was the revenge ninja. When Monday came and went, Sasquatch must have been apoplectic. This is to be assumed since I had cut all communications to let him twist in the wind, but I did receive at least 20 calls to my fake headhunter and multiple faxes. Sasquatch hung around the hotel for a day or two, and then finally decided to leave for home. I assume at some point he may have contacted the watch company, but I never confirmed it. When he finally got home, he found his office had been packed up and sent home with his wife. An HR person met him off-site to give him a severance and retrieve the car and other company property. I heard his wife left him sometime later, and his mistress was fired for theft. I figure he spent at least 10 k on travel in that hotel. I wish I could say I tipped my hand and told Sasquatch that I was the author of his demise, but it really served no purpose, and in theory may have exposed me to some retribution of my own. By my moral lodestar, I got even with a thief that was content to steal and take my livelihood. And that was plenty. And down below, we have this addendum from OP. Very humble that this blew up. I've been accused of having a cold heart on those who have slighted me. I'm not too proud to admit there was some revenge plans that backfired or were never implemented. I'm an argumentative SOB and comfortable enough in my own skin to take a few random jabs and some healthy skepticism from Redditors. I defend myself in the hopes that someone out there will learn that there are indeed times when revenge is appropriate. My real world experiences came before the internet, doxing, ghosting, texting, social media, Google, and all that other stuff that makes people sure everything is a scam. I've had some fun and memorable experiences in my life. The story of Sasquatch is true and less complicated than you'd think. The key to any confidence scam, literally, the word con comes from confidence, is the confidence the mark puts on the con artist. Sasquatch was a Swiss watch fanboy. He wore expensive models and knew everything there was to know about rare watches and their complications. Additionally, he lived for golf, played golf, watched golf, anything golf. So when my recruiter friend from the UK called him and said, my Swiss client is confidently putting together a hospitality slash ambassador position in the US. We're looking for someone who knows golf and other sports that also knows watches and is comfortable with high level interactions at a six figure salary with a huge travel budget, car and entertainment allowances, free or low cost access to the best watches in the world and a budget to set up a small team of minions. How hard do you think it would be for him to recruit Sasquatch? A few faxes from a third party, a phone call or two, and some cobbled together letterhead, and the guy was hooked. If Sasquatch harbored any concerns that it was fake, he certainly would have refused to lay out travel expenses. I mean, I myself have fronted travel money while interviewing, so it really wasn't that much of a reach. I'll say that revenge isn't always pleasant, and sometimes I think it feels a little sickening. There are consequences of this type of action. As I age, I agree to a certain extent that living well is the best revenge. 
but only after someone pays for what they did. Oh man, so these revenge stories are always, they're interesting. I really like the long ones with uh, well thought out plans. The only revenge I ever got like was, you know, like in high school when I, uh, I was in marching band and I, I may have done some dirty things to someone's mouthpiece once. Not nearly as creative and very immature and I don't recommend it uh, to any adults because uh, you could probably go to jail. All right, our other story today is posted by I Hate People Too. This one is hilarious to all musicians. Read your contracts and pay up or else. I work in music production. I charge $125 an hour to edit, mix, and master recordings from bands, and that's about half the average rate. So I had this band come to me and have me mix their album. It took me about 10 hours. 10 times 125 equals $1,250. Well, at the end they said, and I'm not even joking, but this is absolutely ridiculous. Well, an hour only has 60 minutes in it, not a hundred, so your math is wrong and unfair. I, I was stunned because how can people in their 30s be this uneducated? I said, it doesn't matter how many minutes are in an hour, I charge by the hour, and you agreed to it. They had signed a contract. Well, they left and refused to pay. This was their debut album, and little did they know, because they didn't read the damn contract, that I saved backups of all the work I did, and there was a clause that says my studio retains ownership of 100% of the music that I work on until I am paid and sign the rights back to the band. Again, this is very boilerplate contract stuff in the music industry. They had planned on selling their CD at concerts for $20 each, <laughs> so I released their music free online, every site I could find, and I also knew the venues they were playing at, so I made 1,500 CDs, which cost me about $200, but worth it. And every gig they had, I would set up a booth with their CDs just outside the property line of the venue and give their CDs away for free, acting like an agent for the band. One thing they also never planned on, I made the vocals on the CD off pitch with auto-tune. The band broke up about six months later after people stopped going to see them. I love legal revenge. Me and my two friends who helped me had a hell of a laugh. Like we were giddy all the time this was going on. It was great. So remember bands, pay up or get effed. So throughout my life I've been in like seven or eight bands um, and I've been in several studio settings and most of the time uh, it's pretty standard but uh, I kind of, I was in a s opposite situation of this at one point where I was paying, you know, lots of money for like these like blocks of day sessions with my band and we're like all splitting it and it's still coming out to like hundreds and hundreds of dollars for each of us and uh, the engineer we worked with would constantly take smoke breaks and I'm not talking cigarettes I mean he would you know just sit in his in his booth smoking the ganja and uh, you know at the time I kind of didn't feel like I should I was trying to be nicer so I didn't want to like speak up and be like yo dude like we're paying you but uh yeah, it was super annoying and I remember paying him and, and being very frustrated because we could only afford X amount of day blocks because they were very expensive. And because he had taken so many breaks, we left with an unfinished product. And I, I still have it and sure, it sounds better than if I did it in my living room, but it's not finished and it's super frustrating. So yeah, you know, it goes both ways. Just don't be a jerk. Well, that's our show for today. Thank you so much for joining us. If you like our content and want to keep hearing it, please subscribe. If you're on YouTube, subscribe and hit the notification bell. Hopefully we'll see you next time. Bye.